Well, we're going to finish up Psalm 119 tonight. The last letter, the last section of Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verses 169 through 176. If you guys are there, we'll go ahead and read it. In verse 169 it says, Let my cry come near before thee, O Lord. Give me understanding according to thy word. Let my supplication come before thee. Deliver me according to thy word. My lips shall utter praise when thou hast taught me thy statutes. My tongue shall speak of thy word for all thy commandments our righteousness. Let thine hand help me, for I have chosen thy precepts. I have longed for thy salvation, O Lord, and thy law is my delight. Let my soul live, and it shall praise thee, and let thy judgments help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, dear Lord, for all your answered prayers and all your blessings that you blessed us with. Thank you for letting us have a place to come and worship you, Lord, and uh, I pray that you give each and every one of us a blessing. I pray that you be with us, and not only us, but all the ones that want to be here and can't, all the ones that should be here and uh, didn't think it was important. We still pray that you be with them, Lord, and give them strength to get through their lives and their day and let them know that you're with them. The way that we know that you're with us. Uh, we're here because we love you and we want to praise you and we want to gather together to, uh, to glorify you in your house here tonight. So we pray that you be with us tonight. I pray that you be with me and help me in my preaching and fill me with your spirit so I can preach your word with truth and boldness the way you would want me to, the way you would want anybody to. Please be with us, Lord, as we go through this service. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Alrighty, this is the 22nd letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the last one of Psalm 119. Speaking, you know, of the last one, and this kind of goes along with the sermon, Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. The first letter of the Hebrew alphabet was Aleph, A-L-E-P-H. And the meaning of that first letter is the first. That's the meaning of it. It also means the head. As in the beginning or the start of something. The head. You know like the head of a river. That's the start of it. It also means the father of all because he made all. He is the head. <clears throat> Going back to the first since we're here in the last. The Bible says for in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. Everything we know, everything we see, everything we've ever thought of, God has made it. Everything. It says, and all that in them is. That includes all of us, all the animals, everything that we've ever thought about. As far as the creation goes, God is the head of it because he's the maker. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17 it says, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of his glory to his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working, working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things, the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Amen. He is the head of all things. And according to what we just read there, God gave everything to Jesus. 
and made him the head of all things. He is our head. That's why Jesus said, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. He is the head of all things. Jesus said, I am the beginning and the, end, and the ending. He also said that he is the author and finisher of our faith, the beginning and the ending. Amen. He is the head of all things. The first two verses in Psalm 119 say, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. You know, everyone is seeking for that missing part out of their soul or out of their being, their place to belong, <clears throat> their purpose in life, their joy and peace within. Everybody is searching for that. I don't care who you are, everybody is searching for that. You know, unless you're just a couch potato a lump and you don't care about anything. And that's because Satan's got a hold of you and that's right where he wants you. But most people, they're all searching for that missing thing that's in their soul. There's always something missing when God is not there. And those first two verses talk about us seeking God. You know, that's the duty of man, to seek God, to seek His face. You know, we can walk outside and see the glory of God in His creation because it says that He made everything. And He's put it in our hearts to seek Him. That's the purpose of life. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, it says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. You know, fellowship with your heavenly Father gives you peace within and joy in your heart. You know, that missing thing that's in your heart that, you know, so many people look for, all different things in the world to find. They can't find it because it's in Jesus. Because He is the head of all things, including us. And when we don't have Him, there's an emptiness inside of us that makes us look and look and look, you know, for that joy, that peace within. But we never find it until we find Jesus. God has put it in our hearts to seek Him. In John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, that was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. You know, there's a little twinkling light that God has put into every one of us. And that's to seek Him. That little bit of light that He puts in every single one of us. It doesn't matter where you're at in the world. God has put that light in you to seek Him. The more we seek, the more that light grows. The more we seek Him, the more that light grows. Because the more we seek Him... Uh, the closer we get to his fellowship. Like it says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, and also in the book of James. The more we seek, the more it grows. Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. God wants that light to grow, and it can only grow through Jesus. And it can only grow if we are seeking God. Like it says in the first two verses of Psalm 119, Blessed is the man that seeks God. You know, blessed is the man that seeks God. In John chapter 8, verse 12, it says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. That light of life is Jesus. Without that light inside us, you know, we look everywhere, you know, for that joy and that peace and our purpose for being here on in the world but if we don't find Jesus we'll never find it we'll go to our grave with an emptiness inside of us and then after that spend an eternity in a lake of fire because we never sought God who gave us that little bit of light to seek him seek and ye shall find knock and it shall be open unto you for everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh shall be opened. You know, people say, well, these people, you know, in these other third world countries, they never heard of Jesus. You know, they never had the opportunity to believe in Jesus. That's not what the Bible says. When we see the glory of God, it's just in the creation. It says, if we seek, we shall find. If we knock, it shall be opened unto us. For everyone that asketh receiveth. 
Anybody can ask, who made this world? God will give him the answer. When you ask God, God, show me yourself. He will show it to you if you do it with a, a, a pure heart, an undefiled heart. Ask in truth. Everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. If you start seeking God, the creator of this universe, according to the Bible, you will find it. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29, it says, but if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul, if you seek him with all your heart, you will find God. I don't care where you live on this planet. You could be in some jungle uh, out in the Amazon somewhere and never seen a white person before in your life. If you seek God with all your heart, he will send somebody to show himself to you. And I believe that with all my heart. Jeremiah 29, verse 13, it says, And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. That's a promise from God. We are commanded to seek after God in our lives. And people who don't do it, they're going to end up in a place called hell in fiery torments for all eternity. Because God has put that little bit of light in you and you have no excuse to seek God. All you have to do is seek Him with your whole heart and you will find Him. You know, everyone is searching for something missing in their lives. Something only God can fill. Only God can fill it. The problem is they don't want that something to be God. The God of the Bible. People start searching and God will reveal himself to them. But that's not the God that they want. They want other gods. They want it to be money and wealth. Fame and power. Or their hobbies. Or sports. Sex or drugs. Rock and roll music. Any other kind of music. You know, they want that to be their gods. You know, or they want it to be that hippie Jesus like they see on TV. Or in all the pictures, you know, that, that we have of Jesus. You know, with long hair, long flowing hair and beautiful blue eyes and, and wearing a long dress. You know, that's hippie Jesus. That's what we call him. Jesus was nothing like that. Jesus was all man. He dressed like a man and worked like a man every day of his life. There's a show on to, today, I think it's on Netflix, called The Chosen. You know, that's the kind of God that people are seeking. You know, that, that's a wicked show. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's, it's made by Mormons. And Mormons are a cult. They believe that Jesus is the brother of Satan. And that is, he, he's a created being. Jesus is God, and he is the head of all things. Jesus is God in the flesh, but that's not that what, what they believe. You think they're going to tell you the truth on some TV show? Not a chance. It's going to be all full of lies, but that's what people want. They want long-haired hippie Jesus. That's not the God of the Bible. Nobody wants the real Jesus. In John chapter 1, verse 10, it says, He was in the world, and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. You know, they didn't want the real Jesus back then either, the same way they don't want Jesus now. They want some fake Jesus that they can, uh, you know, cuddle up to and say everything is good and he loves me no matter what. And, you know, uh, it's, it's just a fake Jesus. They're preaching another Jesus. They wanted the Jesus that was going to come and put them back in power, if we read the Bible. You know, all the Jews thought that Jesus was going to come and put Israel back in power to rule the world. That's what they wanted. They wanted to be part of the kingdom that ruled the world so they could rule over other people. That's the only thing that they was looking for. They wasn't looking for the Jesus that actually came, the real Jesus. And that's just like today. The prosperity gospel says, you will be wealthy and healthy, giving power unto yourself. That's the Jesus they want. That's going to give them power to be wealthy and healthy. And uh, to not have any distress. Not ever be persecuted. That's not the real Jesus. Jesus said, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's what it says in the Bible. In the word of God. Jesus said, whosoever will be greatest among you, let him be your servant. That's who Jesus was. He came to be a servant. But they didn't want that Jesus. They wanted the all-powerful Jesus to come back and let them rule the world. 
Just like today, you know, fake Christians think that they're going to rule the world or be in power or be in health and wealthy. That's not the real God. That's not the God of the Bible. You know, they want anything but the real God. They'll accept anything. You know, I heard a preacher say one time that he could get a duffel bag and fill it full of rocks and drag it down the street. And by the time he got to the other end of town, he would have a following. That's the kind of thing that people follow these days. They'll follow anything except for the real God. Just go into the Southern Baptist Church and you'll find that. They're not worshiping the real God. Just listen to them preach. That's all you have to do. Jesus said you will know them by their fruits. Go down to one of these non-denom churches. That's not the real God. The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate. Whosoever is a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's not the real God that they're worshiping. You know, the real God is the God of the Bible. It says, be ye holy for I am holy. He also says that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. Let all things be done decently and in order. That's how we conduct our service here. But nobody wants that. They want the fun center, the rock and roll show, the smoke and the lights. The people up there dancing. Uh, girls half naked in church up on the stage. That's what they want. Uh, you know, singing with makeup and miniskirts on. That's not the real God of the Bible. That's their fake hippie Jesus God that they're worshiping. That's not Jesus. That's another Jesus. That's a false Jesus. Who's in control of that? The God of this world is in control of that. The little G God, he's got everybody convinced that they're worshiping the real God, but they're not. They're worshiping a fake Jesus. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30, it says, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth every man everywhere to repent. That means to believe in Jesus. You know, there's a time, you know, back when the Bible was written here in, in, in John chapter 1, uh, when it says his own received him not. You know, everybody was worshiping all kinds of different things. And it says that God, you know, winked at those times. But now commandeth everywhere to repent. Why? Because Jesus came. Jesus came and you had no choice but to believe in Jesus. And the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, he's coming back in vengeance and flaming fire. That those that don't believe the gospel, the gospel of Jesus. He commandeth everywhere, every man everywhere to repent. That means believe in Jesus, the real Jesus, to seek his face. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Those first two verses command us to seek God along with the whole rest of the Bible. We're commanded to seek God with that little bit of light that he's given us and let that light grow. Continuing on in John chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Amen. The verse, first two verses say that we seek him. The last verse in Psalm 119, verse 176, it says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. Seek thy servant. You know, when Jesus, God said, he, but he commandeth every man now to repent, it's because Jesus came. What did Jesus come to do? Come to seek and to save that which was lost. He came seeking us. You know, people weren't seeking God. They was going every which way. Worshiping other gods, going after money, going after wealth, going after, you know, a fake Jesus. But now he commands every man to repent. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. We are all lost sheep at one point in our lives, every single one of us. That's why Jesus instituted the Great Commission. The Great Commission. It doesn't say that in the Bible, but it says in Mark 16, 15, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Because they don't repent. John came preaching repentance. And people say, well, that's repent of your sins. Jesus came preaching repentance. They say, that was repenting of your sins. I don't know where they get that from because the Bible doesn't say it. He came preaching, he commanded every man to repent. That's quit believing in what you was believing in, 
now believe in Jesus because he's here on the earth. That's what they meant by repent. And it even says that in the book of Acts. Believe in Jesus. It says in the Great Commission, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Here in Psalm 119 verse 176 it says, Seek thy servant. Seek thy servant. Jesus isn't on the earth today seeking his servants. He gave us the authority to do that in his place with the Great Commission. He said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He said, Go seek my sheep. Go find them and tell them how to get saved. <coughs> That's how he's seeking his lost sheep today. He's sending us in his place. We have the authority to get people saved. You know, people want to argue about that. Uh, I've heard preachers say we can't get anybody saved. That's not what the Bible teaches. Paul the Apostle said, I became all things to all men that I might save some of them. That's because... We have the authority to get people saved. Our job is to seek the lost. If not us, who? Jesus isn't walking down the street these days. He's up on the right hand of the Father up, in uh, up on high. Who? Is it the Mormons? They're a cult. They've knocked on my door. You know, they want to tell me that I'm going to have my own planet someday. Uh, and Jesus is the brother of Satan. He's a created being. and They don't believe anything in the Bible. Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The Almighty, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. He is God in the flesh. The Jehovah's Witnesses, they've knocked on my door too. They don't believe God is God, uh, Jesus is God in the flesh. You know, they're a cult. That's two cults that have come knocking on your door. Who else has knocked on your door? The Catholics, they don't knock on your door. Uh, the non denoms they don't knock on your door uh, except to try to get you to come to church. They don't give you the gospel, tell you how to get saved. Is it the Jews? Have the Jews ever... Knocked on your door, got on TV and preached the gospel of Jesus? Never. I've never heard them. I've heard, you know, some fake Jews uh, dance around the truth. How about Islam? Have they ever knocked on your door and told you about Jesus, how he died on the cross to save you from your sins? If not us, who? There's nobody else out there. It's just us. The real Christians, the real children of God. We're supposed to be out there seeking the lost sheep. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, it says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador is somebody a king will send to another country in his stead. He's given him all authority of the king in other countries. That's what Jesus has done to us. He's given us all authority to get people saved, to tell them about Jesus. We are his ambassadors. It says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. What is he saying there? It says, by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, ye be reconciled to God. We're praying that other people will get saved. Jesus said, pray ye that God will send laborers into his harvest. Well, guess what? The harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. They are few because people don't believe that we can go out there and get somebody the gospel and get them saved. You know, if somebody's drowning in the ocean and you throw them a, uh, one of those life preservers, does anybody say the life preserver saved them? No, they say that the person that threw it saved them. You know, the life preserver is like the gospel, and it's our job to throw it out there to the people that are drowning. Drowning in sin, drowning in death. In John chapter 20, verse 21, it says, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Who's he talking about? Just the twelve? Or the eleven? It wasn't Judas. What happens when they die? Then it's all over? How come we still have the Bible? How come we have all the epistles that came after that? It's because we are in Christ's stead, just like he says in 2 Corinthians you know, the Corinthians wasn't the apostles, and he was telling them, you are ambassadors. Go out there and spread the gospel. Seek the ones that are lost. Seek my lost sheep. That's our job. If you would go to Ephesians chapter 1. Jesus said, even so, send I you. Who is you? That is us. Us. We are the ones that are supposed to be seeking the lost sheep. 
The shape of this Hebrew letter is a seal or a mark. And I confirmed that with everybody, uh, every uh, commentator I found. They all agree that the shape of this letter is a seal or a mark. You know, Satan tries to copy God and all that he does. The mark of the beast in Revelation chapter 13 is no different. That's just another way that he copies God and everything that he does. He says, I will be like the Most High. He tries to copy him and all that he does. You know, that will deceive many, especially when Jesus or the Antichrist comes, because they're going to put a mark on all that worship the Antichrist, and they're going to believe that that's Jesus. Because Antichrist means in place of. He's going to come showing himself that he is God. Like it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's going to deceive many. They're going to take that mark thinking that's Jesus. The false Jesus that they're worshiping down at the uh, uh, non-denom church. And uh, you know most of the Southern Baptist churches. The hippie long haired Jesus. It will deceive many. When we seek and find God, that means get saved, he puts his mark on us. That's clear throughout the Bible. Satan's just pretending to be God when he makes you take that mark of the beast. In Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4, and this Ezekiel is the hardest preacher in the Bible. It says, And now the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said, In mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite. Let not your eyes spare. Neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they begin at ancient men which were before the house. You know, that's some pretty hard preaching. He said, don't spare anybody, not even the children. You know, children are even known by their works according to the Bible. Children have the ability to believe. You know, it's the ones that don't have the ability to believe yet and know the difference between right or wrong uh, that have a free ticket into heaven. But once you learn the difference between right and wrong, there is no excuse. And that's what he's saying there. Anybody who has the mark in their foreheads, just pass them by. Just like uh, the angel of death passed by the uh, doorpost with the blood on it. He says, pass by them if they have the mark of God in their forehead. In Revelation chapter 22 verse 3 it says, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. And His servants shall serve Him, and they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads. In their foreheads. You know, all these verses is what the Antichrist is going to use to get them to take the mark of the beast in their foreheads. Because it says it right there, that his name will be in their foreheads. God has sealed us with the seal of salvation. You know, that's what this letter represents, a seal. He has sealed us with salvation. He's put his mark on us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, it says, Who hath also sealed us, and give us given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. The earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. You know, I've heard sermon after sermon after sermon of, you know, these fake preachers saying, well, the earnest means the down payment. You know, for lack of a better term, that's stupid. Jesus never made a down payment for anything. He paid in full everything when he died on the cross. There's no such thing as a down payment. You know, when you go give your earnest money to somebody when you're buying a house, that's letting them know that you guarantee them that they're going to buy, you're going to buy it. That's your guarantee. When it says, who hath sealed us and given us, given us, given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts, that means he's given us the guarantee that we're saved. And hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, promised before the world began. You know, there's no down payment that we have to finish paying later on or that he has to finish paying later on. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid in full. The earnest is the guarantee. You have a guarantee into heaven. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say might be saved. It doesn't say go to church and get saved. It doesn't say do great works and get saved. It just says whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? 
And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? We are out there to seek the lost, the lost of God. That's our job. Seeking his sheep, his lost sheep. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. It's just that simple. Believe the gospel, and we will be saved, according to Paul and Jesus, and Peter, and Titus, and every other book in the Bible. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, if you believe, unless you have believed in vain. If you're there in Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 9 it says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, According to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, and whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated, according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, and whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. We are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise and hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. We are sealed with that promise just like the shape of this letter in Psalm 119 the 22nd letter we are sealed with that promise which is the earnest the guarantee of our inheritance our inheritance in heaven. That's our guarantee from Jesus. He sealed us forever everlasting life. Amen. In verse 169 of Psalm 119, the first verse of these eight verses, it says, Let my cry come before thee, O Lord. Give me understanding according to thy word. Give me understanding. When we seek God, he will give us that understanding. Like I said before, you know, when we're praying to God and we're seeking his face, he gives us that little bit of light. The more we seek him, the, the more that light grows. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You know, only God can give us understanding. I marvel sometimes how some people don't get it. You know, when I'm knocking on their door, and, and you can give them every gospel verse in the Bible, and they still won't get it. And it's like they got a glaze over their face. You know, no matter, you can't even beat it into their heads. I've been in churches before, where week after week after week, I've told people that all you have to do is believe the gospel to get saved. And then they'll say, well, it matters what you believe. But then they can't tell you what you're supposed to believe. They just want to argue with you. Why would somebody want to deny the truth? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, they want to add all these things to it just because that's the way the human spirit is. You know, I got to do this. You know, I don't want no charity. I got to work for what I get. You know, I earn everything that I get. No, it's all charity or nothing. If it's not by grace, then it is no more. It's nothing. If you add any works to it or any price to it, it's not grace. It's not free. I don't know why people don't get it. I marvel sometimes. I just don't understand it. I was talking to somebody at their door one day, and I asked him if he knew how to get saved. He said, yep, keeping the Ten Commandments. Have you kept them? Nope. 
And then I gave him the whole gospel, and then I went back and said, now what do you believe it takes to get saved? Keeping the Ten Commandments. Have you kept them? No. Nope. Well, then there's no help for you. Some people you just can't get through. You can't even knock it into their head with a two-by-four. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. They're foolishness unto him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, it says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You know, amen. Jesus came and he spoke in parables. His whole ministry. He spoke in parables so those that didn't believe couldn't understand. But those who did believe could. The ones that did believe they could understand what the deep meaning of what he was saying was. You know, the ones that didn't, it right over their heads. You know, just like that guy with the Ten Commandments. I could have gave him every scripture in the book about believing. He still wouldn't have believed it. And I think I tried. Some people just won't get it. In Matthew chapter 13, in verse number 10, it says, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but unto them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have the more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And them, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. The seal of God, the seal that God puts on us gives us the understanding. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, it says, for who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You know, that only comes when we get saved. We have the mind of Christ so we can understand the dark sayings of the Bible and what it actually means. What it takes to get saved, we can understand it. A lot of people can say those verses, but they don't really understand it in their heart because they're believing in vain. We can truly understand every word of God because we have Christ in us. We have the mind of Christ. And John chapter 15, verse 15, it says, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. I have made known unto you all the things that I heard from my Father. That's understanding, understanding of the Word. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, it says, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And, and, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. John chapter 14, verse 26, it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Amen. You know, we're endowed with the Holy Ghost when we get saved. And the Bible says that he will teach us all things. He will teach us what is truth and what is lies. You know, anybody can sit in a pulpit and discern from their self, if they're saved, what's being told is either truth or lies. Whether it's from the world or from God. And that's what it all boils down to. Is it from the world or is it from God? The Holy Ghost will teach us all things. In John chapter 16, verse 13, it says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. That's that spirit of truth inside us. When he has come, then we shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. It says, he will guide you into all truth. 
For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Amen. John chapter 12, verse 16, it says, These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. You know, the Holy Ghost was not yet given because uh, Jesus was not yet glorified. But when he was glorified, they remembered all things, all the truth that Jesus spoke unto them. It's the same thing today. You know, we're 2,000 years later, but he's still glorified, and we can still have his truth in us, and we shall know the truth. John chapter 2, verse 22, it says, When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. You know, amen. That's the same thing when he was crucified. You know, they remembered the word. The Holy Ghost will bring all things to our remembrance, whether those things are true or not. Every word in this book is true. And we can discern between truth and falsehood, truth and lies, truth in the world. Because the truth is in Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says, as the truth is in Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. You know, He is the head of all things. Back in Psalm 119, in verse 170, the next verse it says, Let my supplication come before thee. Deliver me according to thy word. And hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. That's the word of God, his promise to us that we can be saved if we call upon his name. I'm going to finish up here. In verse 171 it says, My lips shall utter praise when thou hast taught me thy statutes. My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Let thine hand help me, because we are his ambassadors, for I have chosen thy precepts. I have longed for thy salvation, O Lord, and thy law is my delight. Let my soul live, and it shall praise thee, and let thy judgments help me. Amen. Who can praise God in the grave? In Isaiah chapter 38, verses 17 through 19, that's what Isaiah was saying. I'm not going to quote it for you, but he says, Who can praise thee from the grave? You know, let me live so I can praise you. That's our job, to go out into the world and praise God to other people. To seek the sheep that are lost. The ones that can be found. They are few and far between. Just because we go to a few people and they reject Jesus doesn't mean that somebody, you know, a mile down the road won't accept Jesus. You know, seek. Seek the lost sheep of Jesus. That's what we're commanded to do, according to verse 176. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant. For I do not forget thy commandments. Seek thy servant. You know, that's what we're here to do as Christians. God could have took us out of our misery the, day, the second we got saved. And took us up into glory. But no, we're still here. Doing his will. Seeking the lost sheep. Go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. That's the Great Commission. That's what he's saying here. You know, in the first couple of verses in Psalm 119, it says, we need to seek God. In verse 176, the last verse, he says, he will seek us, but he will send somebody in his stead. And that's us. We need to seek the lost sheep, the lost sheep of God. 